Hello, my name is Mark Kerwell. I work for the 7 millimeter Array and I have since 1995. I'm here to present the first talk on calibration for the SMA Interferometry School 2021. Uh, and so basically what this talk will go through is the basic kinds of calibration that are needed to transform the raw data that come from an interferometer called a visibility, um, such as from the SMA and take that into scientifically useful visibility data and from that creating images. That is, you wanna go from data that looks like this to something that looks like this instead of this. I think we can all agree that this one is better and therefore it gets my certificate of calibration. So here's a little bit of outline of what we're gonna cover. We're gonna talk about visibilities, what they are, what they mean, um, you've heard a lot about this already in a few other talks, but we'll just do a quick uh, synopsis of that. Then we'll talk about what gains are, uh, what they mean in terms of calibration, why they are a good thing, uh, and the types of calibration that you need to go through to calibrate a data, particularly an SMA data set. So here, you've probably seen this in various different formats, but this is a two element interferometer taking using SMA dishes here. They are separated by a distance D, which is called the baseline. If you're looking at a source that's at an angle of theta from the zenith, then the wave front will be traveling towards the array and hit one antenna before the other. And if you are able to know the baseline distance D and the orientation of the source theta very well, you can calculate exactly what that delay will be of the light, light rays before it reaches the second antenna. And you can correct for it with a small delay of the signal from antenna one relative to signal of antenna two. And when you combine the data together, you get essentially a constant output. Now, if you look at a, another source, which is slightly at a slightly different angle, um, you will see that there is a bit of an offset. If you're calculating your delay for position theta and your source is at theta prime, there will be a small difference in the phase of the interferometer output that is given by the equation here in simplistic format. So, in practice, visibilities are much more complicated in this because it also depends upon the emission and distribution in the sky. This is described in the Van Zernike theorem, uh, which basically relates the sky brightness distribution as a Fourier transform of the visibility data that an interferometer will see. Uh, you saw this in an earlier talk by Tizo Zeng. Crucially, the measured visibilities are also the result of a lot of modifications as the light travels through space and through the atmosphere down into the antennas through the electronics uh, until it is actually turned into visibility data we can use. So it's a lot of instrumental environmental and observing parameters that affect both the amplitude and phase of the visibility. So here's a few examples that are not exhaustive. There are errors in the antenna positions. So the baseline distance might not be known or the orientation might not be known. There are offset errors in the antenna pointing. There's atmospheric opacity problems. There is atmospheric turbulence and stability issues. There's temperature sensitivity of system components, both the mechanical structure of the antennas uh, or even the electronics might have some sensitivity. The, anything with a signal transfer can have a temperature sensitivity. The spectral response of the system needs to be calibrated. But in general, you can consider that there is a complex gain factor for every baseline that could be a function of time even, which basically takes your measured visibilities, which suggests that your measured visibilities are simply the true visibilities um, times a gain factor plus some noise. So here is an example of that, a two element interferometer with an antenna position error. Instead of knowing our baseline perfectly, 
there's an offset delta to the baseline distance in this case. Therefore, when you calculate the delay that you're putting in on the signal one, assuming you know it to be D and there's actually an offset, there will be a small offset in the delay from what you would expect. That means that the phase you derive of the visibility that you measure is not a constant at zero phase, but a constant with a small phase offset in this simple example. Second example will be, let's consider what the atmosphere might do. The atmosphere is created, is made up of lots of molecules that are dry along with water vapor, which we call wet. And the delay due to various parts of the atmosphere, in particular water vapor, um, delays the signal as it's approaching each antenna. Now, these clouds of water vapor are not perfectly distributed the same over each antenna, and therefore they have a slightly different delay um, over to each antenna. We don't know that a priori, so we correct as we normally have with a delay associated simply with the geometric distance of the baseline, but the delay over each antenna due to the atmosphere creates a phase difference. Now, of course, these things can vary with time, and that means that the visibility, in particular the phase that you measure, will vary with time as well. So what's interesting to note is that when you have this phase difference between the two antennas versus what you would expect for the phase to be zero, uh, that has the exact same functional form as if the source is at an offset position, just like we showed over here. There, there are other sorts of calibrations that one needs to do uh, if you have a two element interferometer, they, the dishes have a field of view, which is called the primary beam. Uh, and you have to point that towards your source. And essentially the primary beam can be thought of as roughly a Gaussian um, window, Gaussian distributed window onto the source plane. And sensitivity is highest right at the center of that Gaussian and sensitivity drops off as you moved away from the center. That means you have to point your antennas and the, you have to point them with a precision that puts your highest sensitivity part of the beam where you want it to be. Unfortunately, you know, telescopes are mechanical, they are not perfect. So we have pointing errors. And in this case, which is obviously a little bit extreme, each of the antennas are pointed a little bit off from where they should be. And that results in a loss of signal basically a loss of sensitivity as to the wavefront as it's approaching the antennas. And that can be thought of as just scaling factors associated with the visibility amplitude. So to best utilize and understand the data, we need to correct in the presence of the all the measurement errors and noise that we have for the gain variations. That is, we want to take our measured visibilities correct them with some gain measurements that we could hopefully make to get what we would consider our best estimates of the true visibilities. And this process is called gain calibration. So nearly all processes contributing to the gain effect uh, happen prior to cross correlation. That is, they affect the signal from each antenna as opposed to pairs of antennas differently. Therefore, a base light can be considered the linear combination of gains from two antennas. So if you have uh, antenna J and antenna K, um, they make a baseline G, uh, J, JK, but the gains can be broken down into antenna base gains. So why is that important? Well, that's because antennas arrays typically have more than two antennas. Here's a two element interferometer for the SMA. But the SMA is actually not a two element on interferometer. Of course, it has eight antennas. And if you add up all the baselines, there are a lot more baselines than our antennas. In fact, you get the equation that's listed here to give you the number of baselines uh, as a function of the number of antennas. And basically it's an N squared problem. Uh, so as you add more antennas, you have many more baselines. But we also know that the data on any particular baseline is got some associated noise. But if you have a lot more baselines, you have antennas and you can break your gains down 
uh, to antenna-based factors, you will actually have many more measurements of visibilities on baselines um, than you will have antenna gains, and you can solve uh, with much higher precision for gains in an antenna-based way. So gain calibration in practice, and in particular at the SMA, involves several steps. And there are other things beyond these steps that are often needed to be taken care of, but these are sort of the basic ones. If you have a data set from an array that has the positions of the antennas known in advance and has certain other calibrations done in advance, as is typical. They include the TSIS calibration, the passband or spectral response calibration, you want to do phase calibration with time and then amplitude calibration, which is often a function of time, but also could be a function of, say, elevation or azimuth um, in addition to time, and then flux calibration. And at the end of that, you would have a fully calibrated data set. So I'm going to work through an example observation from 2018. Uh, this is data that at the time Swarm only had four segments, each eight gigahertz. What right now Swarm has actually been expanded to six segments or 12 gigahertz IF in each sideband for each receiver. So it's about 50% more powerful than what's shown here. But it also gets the plots to be really messy if you have six chunks instead of four. So I just decided to stick with this older data set. The calibration methods are the same between the two data sets, between the two uh, swarm capabilities, old and new. So this is what the raw visibility data looks like um, in the continuum, which at the time was eight gigahertz, but nowadays is 12 gigahertz um, for one sideband of one baseline of one receiver. Uh, there are lots of different sources listed. We have amplitude at the top and phase at the bottom. The green data sets are the target source. Then there are complex gain calibrators, uh, which in this case in the blue is um, 3C84, which is listed according to its J2000 name. Uh, and then also a flux calibrator, Uranus, which is in the red. Uh, and in this particular case, the gain calibrator is also the passband calibrator because it's quite strong and we have lots of observations of it. So the first step is the TSIS application. So what is this? This scales the correlator output, which you can see here is in some arbitrary units, which is approximately can be considered um, correlated, um, a fraction of the correlation signal. So TSIS, calibration basically takes the correlator output and puts it onto a, an approximate flux density scale. And, a, and it also provides a first order correction for atmospheric capacity. Therefore, it is time and elevation dependent. So in this case, uh, you have an efficiency, which is the, or the, the raw correlator output, which is the fraction of the signal correlated between two antennas. You have a system temperature corrected to be thought of as above the atmosphere, so correcting for opacity effects in the atmosphere to first order. Uh, and then you have the forward gains of the antennas. And for the SMA antennas, that's about 130 Jansky per Kelvin of antenna temperature. Therefore, the flux is approximately just the raw correlator output times the corrected system temperature times the gain. So for this particular track on that particular baseline, this is what the system temperatures looked like in Kelvin uh, as a function of time during the track. And you, you can see that the system temperatures are dropping a little bit with time, and that's because the source was rising uh, to higher elevation and therefore lower atmospheric capacity. So after you've cal calibrated using the TSIS calibration, you can see that the amplitude scales have changed. They're now in units around, you know, six or 10 or something like that. And that has that is in Janskys or approximate Janskys now, because we've taken into account the forward gain of the antenna. And you can see that the amplitudes are somewhat flatter than they used to be as well. 
phase has not been affected during this particular procedure because we've only done stuff to the amplitudes. The second step is passband calibration. The spectral response to the interferometer over the, uh, the frequency band uh, that's received is dominated by structure originating typically in the receiving and IF system. There's filter shapes. This response varies weakly and slowly with time. So we generally assume that the passband gain is constant over an observation. This isn't strictly correct because the passband also includes atmospheric effects. Um, particularly in the millimeter and submillimeter there, the Earth's atmosphere has a lot of spectral structure due to water vapor, also ozone, and uh, two smaller amounts of oxygen uh, in particular locations. And even things like CO in the Earth's atmosphere can be detected and affect your observations. So how do we determine passband games? They're usually determined by looking at sources which are very relatively bright and strong uh, such as blazars like a 3C279 or 3C84 in our example. These sources are generally spectrally flat or very slowly varying with frequency so that we can consider them flat over a few gigahertz. Sometimes we can use an object like Uranus or a moon of Jupiter or Saturn if they're strong enough uh, as long as they're not too resolved. We'll go into that in calibration two. So this is what the normalized raw spectrum of 3C84 looks like um, for one side band, the lower side band of the 230 receiver on that same baseline we've been looking at. And each one of the colors represents a roughly two gigahertz segment of the swarm correlator. You can see that they overlap a little bit and that's because the actual correlator segment width is quite a bit larger than two gigahertz. The two gigahertz is what we consider the usable part of the band. And then the band parts that drop down towards zero are in the guard band regions. And we use, uh, we typically just uh, cut off those parts of the bands, but I wanted to show them here so that you can see how they overlap and relate to each other. So again, on top, this is the relative amplitude on bottom is the relative phase. And you can see there's a lot of structure there's some ripples in there. And if you look over here around 232, 231, there's a deeper feature in the blue and that is an ozone feature in the Earth's atmosphere. So you use the mere task pass cal to calculate, uh, in this case, antenna based gains as a function now of channel or frequency uh, for each of the four chunks, or in this case here is antenna three, uh, you have S1, S2, S3, and S4. And you can see it's calculating sort of a wavy structure in the phase as well as in the amplitudes. And this is for a different antenna relate, related to the same baseline, the 3.8 baseline, this is antenna eight. And its structure is, you know, broadly similar, but quite also different in the details between the two. So when you apply that calibration, you basically say, that's what we receive, but we know it's flat. So when you calculate what it takes to take that wavy structure in amplitude and phase and make it flat, that is the gain as a function of the channels and you apply it back to the data in this case, here's 3C84. And again, you get flat uh, spectral response in both the amplitude and phase, but you also apply it to all the other data in the, the track, including your target and other calibration sources. And in this case, this is what Uranus looks like after you've done that. You've taken Uranus and made it also flat. So phase gain calibrations are required to remove both instrumental and atmospheric phase variability, which is typically time time dependent um, from the visibility data. The variability occurs on a variety of timescales, particularly in the atmosphere. Simon Radford has a talk on this. Instrumental variability tends towards slow drifts, though abrupt jumps can occur. These can be caused by a variety of different uh, reasons, um, but they, they are typically just a, an abrupt change in the phase. 
or no obvious occurrence in the data itself. Complex scheme calibrators are typically bright AGN. They are often blazars that work effectively like bright point sources. The closer to the target they are, the better, because the atmosphere is similar. Here's an example of what the of distribution of sources on the sky is. Uh, and you can see that some sources, the dark black sources, we have a lot of those, but they tend to be the fainter ones. The, high, the higher the brightness, the less uh, number we have of them in the sky. So we calculate phase gain solutions, again, antenna based using the Mirtas gain cal. Um, this is our gain calibrator 3C84. And as we do antenna based gains as a function of time, uh, you can see the red line is going through all of the blue dots, which the blue dots are the actual data uh, antenna decomposed phase. We then apply that data. And then here is antenna eight. Uh, so the 3A baseline is created by phase measurements from antenna three versus antenna eight. Antenna eight has a potential jump in the phase where there's been an abrupt change. This could be instrumental, it could be atmospheric, um, but in either case, we need to take care of it. The gain calibration does that. When you apply that phase gain, gain calibration back to the data, here it is the baseline 3.8, that has been applied to all of the sources. You can see that the phase of most of the sources all is lying near zero which means it's at the face center of, of the field of view, the, the interferometer after the calibration. Uh, there are some deviations, um, in particular at the beginning of the track, the green target source appears to be deviation, deviating away from zero. Now this could be real structure in the source. It could be uh, also differences in the atmosphere between where, where the source position was and the calibrator position was. Uh, at the time, and we just don't know at this point right now. Imaging later on might tell us if this is real or if it's something that could be corrected. Amplitude gain calibration uh, is usually required to remove instrumental variability from, say, an odd non optimal antenna pointing model, and residual correction for atmospheric opacity from the visibility data. Variability occurs also on a variety of timescales. However, it is generally slower than phase variability, but not always. Sometimes they are related. If the atmosphere is very unstable, you will, your phase will actually begin to affect the amplitudes as well because we integrate over a certain fraction of time. And if the phase instability is shorter than that integral time, uh, you will decorrelate the signal during an actual scan. Uh, resulting in a drop in amplitude. Complex gain calibrators, again, are typical bright AGN. They are effectively point sources, and the closer to the target they are, again, because of the similar atmosphere. Here we're using 3C84, and we have an expanded view here of the amplitude gains for antenna 3 using the gain cal task. Uh, the scale you might note in the amplitudes is actually pretty small. It's only got about 8% variation over there. So it looks noisier than it really is. But it does have some smooth structure. This has been fit with a third order polynomial, um, but it could be done smoothing with time. We could also attempt to do this as a function of elevation if we thought that there was something about the pointing model in particular that was a function of elevation, or if we thought that there was something about the atmospheric uh, system temperature correction that wasn't working out very well, um, but time is usually the best bet to start with. And here is for the other antenna that creates the 3A baseline antenna 8. It has a similar curve, but again, not exactly the same, um, a variation with time and perhaps a little bit more variation uh, with time than antenna 3. Then after you apply that calibration, you can see that 3C84 has been corrected to be extremely flat as a function of time. Those calibrations are also applied to the other sources, including Uranus and the target source, and should be correcting almost all of the data now 
for amplitude and phase variations as well as pass and variations. So the final step is then to do flux calibration. Flux calibration is required to place the data on a uniform scale, a consistent scale that can be used by any telescope anywhere. Uh, this is sort of like using standard stars in optical observing. You look at a source of a known flux and you calculate a gain which takes your data that has been measured and puts it on that same scale. So unlike gain calibrators, which are bright point sources, flux calibrators uh, are typically solar system sources because we can calculate uh, and or measure their flux densities uh, with much more precision than we can for the lasers, which are quite variable with time on time scales uh, that are often relatively rapid on days and weeks and month scales. Typically solar system objects because uh, they're just radiating heat uh, that they have internally have much slower variability uh, uh, of their temperatures and we can model them. Uh, so that we have a pretty good handle on their flux uh, densities and therefore we have a scale that's much better uh, attuned to the needs that we have. So in the early days of millimeter astronomy, uh, Mars and Jupiter were the favorite standards. Um, however, they're actually kind of big, uh, particularly for uh, the SMA, which has resolutions that are you know three arc seconds down to 0.3 arc seconds depending on the array that you're in use. Uh, and Mars and Jupiter are almost always much, much bigger than that. So at the SMA, we tend to use uh, Uranus, Neptune, uh, and then the jo Jovian moons, Ganymede and Callisto, uh, and Titan. I will discuss flex calibration in particular in more detail in calibration too. So when I took the Uranus data for our for this uh, baseline. And I, I compared it to what we expected for Uranus. I found that you needed a scaling factor of 23% in this case. To move the, the flux, the, the amplitude scale onto a proper flux density scale. And you can apply that because this gain should be something that is constant for the track F. Since you've cal calibrated all of the gains with time and frequency, uh, except for an absolute offset scale. Um, that's a, basically a single scale for this baseline. It can be antenna based uh, easy enough. And that can be applied to all of the data on that baseline. That should put all of your data onto a proper scale. So I will continue uh, on this vein in calibration too, but I wanted to give a few final thoughts here as we're ending this first talk. Um, these basic calibration concepts, in most cases, will allow the raw data to be transformed into science usable visibility data. But there are cases where you will need further calibration. If you want to update the position of antennas, uh, you probably would want to go through data editing to improve your calibration outcomes. When you're done and completed with your gain calibration, you will be able to use that data directly. You can do things called visibility analysis, which just looks at this visibility data versus what you might expect for a source and are, you're able to derive very precise uh, science information from the data. Uh, you can also take this visibility data and make images um, through the appropriate algorithms. And these of course will be talked talked about in other talks at the school. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been my pleasure to give you this presentation and I look forward to any questions. Uh, my email address is on the top first page of this uh, and first in every page uh, of this presentation. So please drop me an email note if you have any questions and I hope to see you also at the discussion sections that we have. Thank you.